interesting angle on on the topic. Okay, coffee break now. Uh, till uh, eleven thirty. Yeah, as in the program. Thank you. Okay, perfect. You you manage to put your slides. Yes. Good. 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 <laughs> Okay, let's wait a couple of maybe one minute. Sergey, Claudius, uh -huh. uh, is Daniel around? We will see a question. Uh, oh, yes, yes, I see. Uh, Daniel, you can look at uh, question and answers, and actually, in the online system, you can answer them directly online. Okay, I hope he will come and. Okay, our next speaker is from uh, Nokia Labs. So we will see an industrial view on machine learning and optical communication. So Matthew, please, your time, your floor. Yes, uh, thanks, Sergey. So hi, everyone. Um, it's, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today, virtually, uh, but, but, but still. Uh, my name is Mathieu Chagnon. I do work for Nokia Bell Labs. I'm located in Germany, more specifically Stuttgart. And today I want to talk about uh, digital communication systems and more specifically uh, fiber optic communication systems and how we can leverage machine learning to help better communicate through these systems. And so I, I will assume that you guys hear me well and, and I can continue. Otherwise, I can hear you. So please stop me if anything goes wrong. Um, the outline of the talk is going to go as follows. I'll first talk about uh, digital communication systems per se, and then the challenges to communicate through digital communication systems, and more specifically for fiber optic communication systems. And I'll be solely focusing on fiber optic communication systems relying on coherence detection. Right? I will not be addressing direct detection. Uh, then I'll be talking about some of the conventional transmitter and receiver side DSPs that we use for fiber optic communication systems. And I'll talk about uh, some of the methods that we can use to replace the RX DSP, so the DSP that we apply on the receiver side with quote unquote machine learning DSP. I don't like the word machine learning too much, but uh, yeah, so sort of different types of DSPs if you wish. And then I'll be focusing on the equivalent, but on the transmit side. And if you do both TX and RX, then you sort of, you can learn to communicate from end to end. And the challenges is really to, to train the transmit side DSP. So I'll be addressing that. And then I'll talk about, uh, I wanna talk about several results, but I'm, for lack of time, I'm only gonna, gonna be presenting one of the latest results about uh, training the transmit side DSP of a fiber optic communication system. And then, uh, then we'll come the Q and A session and hopefully I'll be able to answer your, uh, your tough questions. So uh, to begin with, uh, there's the, um, the, the paper, the seminal paper from Claude Shannon from 1948, a mathematical theory of communication. This is the paper that pretty much laid the foundations of information theory. Uh, the, idea is to, to, the idea of communication is to reproduce at one point exa uh, either exactly or approximately a message selected at another point. This is quote unquote verbatim from a Claude's a paper. And Claude Shannon in his paper has that schematic representing what he calls, as you can see from the bottom of the screen, a general uh, communication system where there's the source of information for us, it's gonna be bits, then there's transmitter, then there's this channel here, and we're, we're gonna have a look at this later on, then there's the receiver, and the goal is to send these bits to the, to the destination, right? And he calls that general. And I'm, I mean, one would argue that, uh, it could be even more generic in the sense that you could view that system as I have hard bits coming in and I need to apply some digital signal processing. It's digital because the bits are digital and it's digital because I'm the output of the DSP at the TX is our integers that I'm sending to a DAC, right? So it's hard bits in, hard integers out. That's the task of my DSP at the TX. And then I'm sending this to the wild. Something's happening. There's what we call the channel there. And what I'm sensing, what I'm probing at the receiving end are integers coming out of the ADC. And I'm passing those integers to another stack of DSP. 
and what I want to spit at the output are what, what we call soft bits, right? And that channel can really be anything. It can be like, it can, it can include the analog response of the DAG, the RF amplifiers, the transducer. In fiber optic, we use transducers being mags and modulators that have their own quirks and characteristics. It can include, of course, the propagation of the waveform itself, anything that's analog between the integers that I send that I control and the integers that I'm probing, anything in between uh, is in that channel. And uh, I wanna quickly talk about um, what we mean by soft bits here. And so by definition, so, so each transmitted bit has to have a, a, a corresponding soft bit, which is an estimate of the transmit bit, right? And by definition, it's the probability that the ith bit be subscript i, the, the probability of that bit being equal to one, given that the j sample at the system output equals lowercase y, right? And mathematically, it's represented by this formula that you, that you can see in the, bottom, in the middle of the screen. And obviously, the soft bit that I denote as b hat subscript i, that has to have a value between zero and one, obviously. And if the transmit bit was zero, for instance, then we want b hat subscript i to be as close to zero as possible. For instance, a value of zero, zero, two would be very, very good. And if it was a one, then I want that estimate to be as close to one as possible. Therefore, for instance, 997 would be extremely good as well. Okay. Then one quick note about, um, can I, hang on a second, I'm gonna move this, this point. No, I can't move that, okay. One quick note about uh, binary encoding and decoding. <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, on the top of the screen, you see the schematic that we, we will be looking at, which is what I just presented. Typically systems, digital communication systems have a preceding encoding block in a subsequent decoding block, right? Where the preceding uh, encoding block takes hard bits coming in and pretty much generates more hard bits, right? It's uh, you sort of add redundancy, you, ha you add parity checks, you add what, what have you, such to sort of protect these bits, right? And at the receiving end, you have soft bits and then you go to a, like a, either a soft in, soft out or soft in, hard out sort of decoder. Uh, I will be, in that talk, I will not be talking about the encoder and decoder part. I will just talking, be talking about the sort of hard bits to soft bits. And if you improve that system, then obviously you, you will be improving on the soft, um, on the capability of the, of the, of the encoding and decoding uh, blocks. So one of the challenges that I'm gonna be addressing four challenges for these systems. Uh, one of the challenges is to know and define the digital architecture. So I'll say differently, the compute graph and the weights that these compute graphs are made of at both the TX and RX side for the DSP functions, such to minimize, so what, what's the best compute graph and what are the best weights such to minimize the difference between the transmit bit and the recovered sort of soft bits for every bit. And on the next slide, I wanna, def I wanna before I tell you the three other challenges, I wanna talk to you about what do we mean by the difference between B subscript I and B hat subscript I, All right? So there's sort of two ways where, where we can, uh, well, look, look at this. Uh, we said if uh, the transmit bit was a zero, then a value close to zero is good. And if it's one, value close to one is good. So we, we can, what, we, what do we mean by, by distance? We could use sort of two distances if you wish. We, we could use like a square distance loss where if my transmit bit was a one and I know that it was a one, then I could say that, that I want to minimize uh, the system output being B hat minus one squared. I could say that. And if it was a zero, then I, I want to minimize B hat minus zero squared. Okay. And if you look at that would be, um, because B hat can only take values between zero and one, then that loss would, would give you like the, what you see on the, let me try to move this. I'm sorry, I'm struggling with my screen. But you would see um, the, dashed, the, the, the dashed lines on the right hand side of the screen, right? This would be the square distance loss. But an even better loss would be the log loss where if my transmit bit was a one and I know that it was a one, then I wanna minimize 
this distance, which I, now def which I now define as being the negative of the logarithm of the system output, which is B hat. And if I know there was a zero, I, I want to minimize the negative of the log of one minus B hat. And this gives us the two solid line curves, again, on the bottom right uh, inside of the screen. And as you can see, this is a much more penalizing loss, or if you wish, a much more penalizing distance. And you can see that if I'm completely off, my distance, quote unquote, becomes a D infinity. And we'll be talking about gradients later on. As you can tell, if I take, if I'm off and I take the gradient to move in the right direction, I'll get much stronger gradients by using the log loss than, for instance, the square distance loss. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind for now. Uh, now, the other three challenges uh, of digital communication systems per se, not specific to fiber optic, but just digital communication system is, that we don't know what's the Jacobian of the channel, right? We don't, if I change, if I send the vector of integers and I'm looking at, and, I, and I'm receiving a, a vector of integers, if I send, if I change and modify one of these integers, let's say this 145 to 146, I don't know exactly which of the received integers will change. And I don't know by how much, right? So, be, so differently, again, as I said, we don't have the Jacobian of the channel. This is one sort of hard task of, uh, one hard challenge to communicate. Second thing is the transfer function between Tx and Rx is discrete. I'm sending integers and I'm probing integers. So it's not continuous, which makes it even harder. And the third thing is that the channel adds some stochastic stuff between what I send and what, and, and what I'm receiving. And a priori, a priori, I don't know what that stochastic stuff is. I shouldn't make any approximation or estimation of what that stochastic stuff is. Okay, so these are challenges for, these are the four challenges for digital communication systems per se. Now, it's more specific to fiber optic and more specifically fiber optic rely, uh, relying on coherent detection. There's, for, for, to talk about that challenge, we need to look at the system per se. So if I sort of uh, break out those, those three blocks on top, so DAC, channel, and ADC, for fiber optic, uh, with with coherent detection, it looks like this. Right, you have three, you have four streams of integers that you feed to DAX. They are applied. There's the transducer. There's the physical uh, propagation, and the, at the, at the receiving end, there's what we call the polarization beam splitter. We inject an LO, and then there's like the tra transducer from uh, electrical to optical. And the problem is the fact that we use a polarization beam splitter and the fact that we actually inject an LO to transduce from optical to electrical. And I want to look at with you, I want to look at the impact of those two things, the detection mechanism, from the point of view of the, of the distribution of the transmit and received signals over time. So if you look at the TX first, um, I'm, I'm going to take a super simple example, you know, like, like dual full QPSK. So each tributary is sort of high, low NRZ. Okay. And of course the transmit adds a bit of noise. So one, this is like a toy example, one distribution at, uh, out of one tributary at the TX could look like this sort of two lobs. And if you look at, uh, at now, and if you look in one second and in 10 seconds and in, and in 10 minutes, that distribution will not change over time, right? This is sort of, that's what my TX does and that's it, that's all. If I, however, look at the receiver side, the picture is quite different, right? Because of the presence of the beam splitter and of the LO, the distribution at one um, input to one ADC changes drastically over time, right? Which means that it's not stationary. So if I look at the distribution at time T1, I, I can, I can see this, like my, my ADC can be sampling something that looks like that at T1. And then I look later on and I could be sampling something that looks like this and at T3 and at T4. And these toy kind of, th these toy distributions are only considering SOP var uh, variation. So the variation in, instead of polarization. On top of that, there's the fact that I'm injecting an LO and there's the frequency and phase offset between the LO and the impinging signal. And that also spins everything and makes, again, everything even more non-stationary. And so this makes it hard, right? Uh, and that's a summary slide of like what's happening at the TX is distribution are time variant, whereas at the RX, it's time variant. And the reason why I said that it makes it hard because at the output, I wanna, I wanna output something 
where my, my B hat I, that those outputs, I want that to be time invariant. I don't want this to be changing over time, but my inputs, the distribution is constantly changing over time, but and at, 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 a, at a pretty fast pace. So I need to deal with that at the receiving end. Now I want to talk about the conventional transmitter and receiver side DSP for fiber optic communication systems per se. Uh, uh, let's of course start with the TX side. Um, typically you, you uh, define a bit of symbol mapping function. Let's say that we use gray uh, coding. And then because typically the DAC symbols at a different rate than the symbol rate, the DAC would typically symbol a little faster than the symbol rate. So I need to use what's called inner jargon. It's a funny word, but we use what's called pulse shaping, which is a funny way to simply say that I need to put data points or samples between known symbol position, right? We call this pulse shaping in our, in our jargon. And then we use, uh, one, once that's done, when I have a like a waveform stream that is at the DAC sampling rate, and then I, we typically conventionally apply some simple DSP, right? Typically this would be like an FIR pre -anifices. And then we need to stretch, scale, offset, and quantize, sort of like rounding the signal to generate integers. And then we send these integers to the DAC and out comes an analog waveform. And then here's the tour example. Again, in the case of like an eight level, for let's say that you do like dual pole 64 quam or what have you. So, so this is the output of one tributary for, for, for example, once again. Now on the RX side, uh, as I said, the distribution is constantly changing and I, I, I don't wanna be discussing about the exact building blocks of the receiver side. Of course, when you, the, the, five, the single mode fiber exhibits chromatic dispersion, you need to compensate for that. But pretty much the, the, the task of the receiver side DSP is to stabilize the, the distribution, right? Get stable statistics, make the signal stationary. That's what, by and large, is what the, that's what the DSP has to do. So we need to stabilize slash remove the polarization rotation with respect to the receiver axes. We need to stabilize slash remove the frequency plus phase deviation with respect to that of the yellow that we inject at the receiving end. And we need to stabilize the time base. So the ADC clock with respect to the uh, DAC clock. And then once that all done, then you can compute the soft bits because I, I, I need something that's stationary to compute the soft bits. And I wanna talk about that in that slide now. Um, again, so um, we are seeking to compute a probability. And once again, that is, uh, sorry, let, let, let me look at the top of the screen uh, for, for some second. Let's say that, let's say that with conventional uh, DSP, I'm able to stabilize and get some estimate of what was transmitted. For instance, some estimate of like an eight level signal or what have you. And for each time bin, I'm, I'm sampling that stuff. And let's say that for the J time bin, the sample value is Y, right? So then the question is, knowing that I'm sampling a Y, look, sorry, lowercase Y, what is the probability that the ith bit was a one? Again, knowing that I'm sampling a Y now. So we are seeking obviously a probability. So therefore we need to talk about probabilities. And bear with me, I'll be talking about probabilities for maybe, maybe the next like three, four slides because it's important because that's the, that's the, that's the thing we are looking for. Right, so we are looking, what, what we want is B hat, right? And which is by definition of what, what we just said here, which is what we're, what we're looking for is the posterior probability that the ith bit was in one. And you can use Bayes theorem to get something, to get going, to get moving, right? You can, you can use Bayes theorem and say, well, Bayes says that this, the, the thing we're looking for is actually the prior probability of sending a one multiplied by this probability here of uh, sampling a Y given that I sent a one normalized by something. And the normalization is just the fact that this posterior probability of that the ith bit was a one plus the, if plus the posterior that it was a zero, those two quantities must obviously sum to one, right? If it's a, you know, like 0.3 plus 0.7, sort of like this thing, these two things must sum to one. And therefore I need to normalize the posterior to make sure that these two sum to one. Okay, so now you can ask yourself, what is that quantity in the, in the, what is that pink box there? Well, 
that's the, this is defined by that equation. So this is, I'm gonna use some weird vocabulary here. This is the marginalization of all the possible transmitted symbols, right? So this is the, this is the sum of like, uh, what is the probability of sampling a Y? Is the probability of sampling a Y knowing that I sent a certain symbol multiplied by the probability of sending that symbol knowing that the ith bit was a one. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna go, because this, this talk will be recorded, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through all these equations verbally, but you will have them uh, in video to, 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 to go through after. And again, I'll be available for the Q&A after as well. So then the one can also ask, what's that thing? What's the probability of sending a, 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 a certain symbol given that the ith bit was a one? Well, that is pretty much in a nutshell, this is a resetting and renormalizing of the prior probabilities of transmitting symbols, right? So if I have a certain prior probability of transmitting symbols, and I can again use Bayes' theorem to pretty much uh, re reset and renormalize these priors, knowing that I'm now living in a world where the ith bit was a one, is, is, is a one. Okay, and I'm, and I'm gonna use this slide to express what this really means. If I have certain priors, right? And I know that for instance, the third bit is a one, then if you look at, if I can have a pointer, laser pointer, if I look at the probability that the, of, um, that the J transmitted symbol is S1, given that the third bit is a one, well, that is zero. This is impossible that, that I'm sending S1, symbol S1, if I know that the third bit is zero, right? Whereas for S2, I need to sort of renormalize such that the new thing sums to one. Okay, and uh, now that we have all these blocks, and again, I apologize if that's heavy, we have all these blocks, we can put all this together and finally get a quantity for what we're looking for, the posterior of the posterior probability that the ith bit was a one, which gives us that equation. And uh, as you can see, there's sort, of a, there's, there's sort of a normalizing factor again, such that as we said earlier on, the sum of these two posteriors that the ith bit transmitted was a one or zero that must sum to one. And I want, and there are quantities that we know and there are quantities that we don't know actually. So we know what the prior probability of sending a one, this is typically 0.5. This is the first green box here. And the second green box is, as we just said earlier on, based on our pre-established prior probability of sending symbols, I, I know what's the sort of renormalized priors of sending symbol, given that I'm living in a world where the ith bit was a one, okay? That we know. What we don't know is what is the, what is the distribution of all possible lowercase y's that I can receive, that I can sample, given that I, I sent a certain symbol at the transmitter. So, so, so again, a, a, a priori, we don't know that quantity, right? And before I move on to the next slide, I just want to have a quick note on notation. So what, what I call P uh, capital case Y given something, this is a function, right? So this is sort of, you can view this as like a symbolic function. There's no value assigned to capital case Y yet. So just a symbolic function. If I assign the value to capital case Y, let's say uh, I assign the value lowercase Y, then that function becomes a scalar. It, it, it's, it's, it looks dumb to say it like this, but it'll become uh, uh, more uh, useful la uh, later on. So I said, we don't know what's in the red box. And this is where Shannon comes into play. And Shannon says, well, let's, let's define something for that red box, right? So let's say that, what pretty much what Shannon says is let's define the whole system, which is super complex, as let's simplify that to I'm sending symbols, I'm adding noise, and that's what's coming out of the system. And the noise that I'm adding is going to be Gaussian, zero mean, and, and certain standard deviation. That's pretty much what the model is we have at hand now, right? And with that assumption, we now have a distribution or specifically a function governing the probability of sampling a certain value y as a function of the transmitted symbol. And we have as many distributions for as many tra possible transmitted symbols that we have, right? And at the bottom left of the screen, you have like one example of, let's say what that symbolic function would be. 
if I uh, give, uh, given that I'm living in a world where the first symbol was transmitted. So now we have a value for that red box that we were missing because of this simplified model. And with that, we can now have a closed form expression to finally compute what we're looking for, which is B hat, which is the prior, which is the posterior, right? And now we said that the posterior is a quantity that varies between um, zero and one only. Well, we can, we can um, get rid of the normalizing factor by taking the ratio of, of the probability, um, the posterior of sending a one and the posterior of sending a zero. If you, if you, because both of these quantities have the same denominator, obviously. So if I take the ratio, I obviously get rid of that annoying the denominator. And because the posterior of one plus the posterior of zero must sum to zero, I can change the, the denominator of the ratio. I'm going to use my pointer here again to, to be equal to this. Therefore, the ratio is just like B hat subscript Y divided by one minus this quantity, right? And the ratio really changes the, 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 the domain of the posterior from zero to one to a domain that is zero to plus infinity. Right, and that that quant that function, that um, symbolic function, x divided by one minus x, or b divided by one minus b, that's a bijective function. It it it, it has a total one-to-one -one mapping. If if I know one, I know the other one. Um, and so we said that we can take the ratio to to change the domain from zero to one to zero to infinity. Even better than that is to take the logarithm of the ratio, which will further convert the domain from zero to one, then zero to infinity, and then minus infinity to plus infinity. By taking the logarithm of something that goes from zero to plus infinity, I change the domain to minus to plus infinity. And again, the, log the logarithm of that ratio is also a bijective function. And I sort of plot that schematic here of that function on the right hand side of the screen. But all, all of these functions are bijective. Which means, once again, let me repeat, if you know one, you know exactly the other one. If I know b hat, I know lb hat, or vice versa. Okay, so um, I want to do a slight amendment on what I said earlier on. I said that the system output are those posterior, which are values from zero to one. It's actually not true. Uh, what, what, what the system output is typically log of that function, which is once again, it doesn't matter, it's completely equivalent. If you know one, you know the other, but typically we, we deal with log of the ratio of this thing because it's easier to deal with. There are, there are other reasons why we deal with that, but typically this is the system output. So I just want to point that out. And if I know L uh, B hat, then using this, what's called a sigmoid function at, at the bottom of the screen, I can then recover uh, B hat. Okay. Um, now back to the conventional method of the RX DSP. Um, again, there's a, there's a system output, a lowercase y, and the soft bit out is obtained using the, so Shannon's approximation of things being Gaussian. So what's in the, what's in the red box using that and using the closed form expression of the logarithm of this thing, the, the, the logarithm of the ratio. Because now we have all these quantities because we assume something for the red box we can now compute this posterior probability. Okay, one important note is that, as you can see, we're, at, we're, we're actually looking to get posteriors and, and improve on the posterior, but what we typically train, train for in the system is to actually minimize the assumption of the red box. We actually train to minimize, or said differently, maximize the value of this red box, which is the probability, or said differently, minimize the squared difference here, even if the objective is to get better, on average, better L of B hat. Okay, just one, one it's, I think it's important to mention this. Now, what about replacing uh, Rx DSP with uh, machine learning type of DSP? So one sort of basic idea of machine learning, and again, I, I'm, I'm using machine learning this is an abuse of language and I'm absolutely aware of this. I should be using, for instance, like deep learning or what have you, because machine learning is sort of an all encompassing term and I'm using it sort of loosely, but I, I'll still be using machine learning. Again, sorry, bear with me for that sort of poor definition of the, of the, of the word. But the basic idea of quote unquote machine learning is to learn function. 
instead of imposing functions, we can learn function. And that's where we, I get back to the idea of symbolic function versus scalars. So if you, if you look on the left hand side of your screen, f of x would be a symbolic function of x. For instance, log of x divided by one minus x is a symbolic function of x, right? And if I, and that you know, once again, you have like the pictogram, the schematic of what that function looks. If I assign a value to x, if I assign a value to the argument f of x, then this becomes a scalar. f of x, when, when x equals something, that, that becomes a scalar, right? And the idea of neural network is, using a neural network as a function is we inject the argument of a function to a neural network and we look at we we look at what's coming out and in supervised learning more mode we basically train and tweak the neural net when 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 we know what we're looking for again in training mode not in inference mode it's when we know what we're looking for we can train the neural net to output values closer to y for this given input argument and therefore we train to, to minimize some distance. I'm not defining the, this, the distance here, to minimize the, some distance such that the neural net acts as a function. If I inject the argument, I'm gonna be spitting something that would be the same thing as if I was to use a symbolic function. But this neural net is super generic, right? So the, I'm gonna, the next, the next uh, I think three slides will be sort of a, a possible, three of many possible approaches to use uh, machine learning as the RxDSP, right? So the first approach is instead of, uh, instead of imposing this, uh, this red box, which is the, in machine learning jargon, this is like, this is called the likelihood of sampling value Y, given that a certain uh, symbol was transmitted. So instead of imposing that, as Shannon mentioned in his paper, for good reasons, because he wanted to move on and, and get a close form formula, instead of imposing this to being a Gaussian, let's just, let's just learn that function. Let's inject argument, which is the lowercase y in green here, and inject that to a neural net, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, and spit out scalar values, which represent those probabilities. Now, the reason why I need to output several probabilities is that um, this function P of, you know, uh, capital Y equals lowercase y, given something, you can look at this, you, you, you can view this function as being sort of a function of two variable, let's say Y and X, as you can see, I guess, if I use my pointer here. And Think of this function f of y and x as sort of a like a like a surface, like a like a like a two D surface. So like a, they have a z value, you have a x values and y values, and sort of z, right? Z is the output. And if I select a certain x value, in our case is s, but okay, let's, let's call it x. If I select a x, then the remaining symbolic function for y, if I just follow, like if I take a plane for x equals something, x equals that not. The, the, the value of the function y obviously depends on the plane that I choose for x, right? So if I'm changing the value of x, I get different functions coming out. I get different symbolic functions coming out. Therefore, I need different um, outputs which represent different functions uh, evaluated at different values uh, for, the, for the x. Right, and then using these neural net outputs, p subscript one to p subscript y, uh, p subscript eight, as you can see here, here on the bottom right of the screen, I can then inject this to our definition of the uh, posterior per bit, l hat, and then using the close form expression, get a value for these log of the soft bits, or therefore, so differently, get values for the soft bits that we're looking for. Okay, this is one thing we can do. Second thing we can do is. Um, we can directly learn instead of actually uh, Im imposing a, a closed form symbolic expression for the logarithm of uh, B hat, I can actually learn directly a function once again, where the argument is Y and I'm spitting, I'm outputting directly estimates of the uh, soft or so the logarithm of the soft bit, right? Directly, I can I can skip the red box and I can skip the uh, closed form expression of the L B hat and spit directly those values and 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 actually learn that mapping as a function. 
And once again, if uh, here I'm using an example where there's if there's more than one bit embedded within the sample value y, then it, I need to output as many estimates of the bits of the number of bits embedded in that sample. Or more generically, in the red uh, white dashed box, I can inject y's and output l uh, b hat, right? And funnily enough, we still use, and I should go back one slide, uh, for learning the red box, we still use conventional VSP to sort of stabilize. And we, we, uh, we, um, we train, even if we learn something that may not be Gaussian, we still train as if it was Gaussian. So we still typically conventionally train to maximize the probability of the Gaussian, therefore minimize the square difference. But we're actually looking for something else, which is a bit funny, but this is one, one way to do, to do this. In the second approach, we also uh, do the same sort of training to stabilize and get stable distribution for the lowercase y's here. So we, once again, even if we learn the whole function of the uh, soft log bits, we still typically train to, again, <laughs> Funnily enough, we train to stabilize by maximizing the likelihood of that being Gaussian, even if we're, we are in the end not going to use this and going to be learning a completely new different mapping function from the simple value to the uh, soft bits out, right? Which is a funny thing, but that's what we see currently in some papers, right? Uh, and and the third thing that we can do is, which is the toughest, the hardest by far, is to learn directly a function mapping from the ADC integers directly to the um, soft bit, so the, the, the logarithm of the ratio. So in that case, as you can see, I'm injecting directly from this picture that you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm directly injecting integers to the, to the neural net, out comes these log of the ratio of the bits, and that's really hard because the neural net does the, all the job. The neural net does everything. And it's super hard for a non-stationary system because as we said, the input is not stationary and I want my outputs, L of the soft bits, to be stationary. And again, as we said earlier on, let me repeat, a given sequence of transmit bits uh, transmitted at time one and at time two will give to completely different sequences of integers at the receiver side. Right, so different distributions that I'm going to inject to my receiver side neural network. So what we can do to sort of deal with that, but again, it's quite hard, is to sort of constantly train, we can constantly train slash constantly adapt the neural, the neural network to track these changes such to stabilize the output, the uh, capital case L, even if the input is changing. This is not convenient to do that because obviously if your neural net is huge and complex, you need to constantly train that. It's pretty computationally uh, you know, massive and expensive. Second thing we can do is to actually sort of, which is also not very convenient, but it's one way. You can expand the size of the, uh, the, size of the neural network to learn sort of all possible dynamic input distributions, right? But again, this is also not practically super convenient because you get all, like neural nets are typically already somewhat massive compared to conventional VSP. And now the idea is to make it even more massive to sort of learn everything, right? So it's one approach, you can do this, but it's not quite practical. And the third thing you can do is, this is more like adding expert knowledge, quote unquote, to the system by, for instance, inserting a pilot at the transmitter. You can, as an example, sort of extract from the integers, the clock drifts and the phase and frequency offsets, and the polarization rotation, you can track separately using like a separate system, all these time changing stuff to sort of stabilize the distribution. And the stabilized distribution does not need to be like a perfect eight level something. It could be something else, as long as it's stationary over time. And once you have a stationary uh, distribution, then you can inject that to a neural net to do the entire job. That's the third thing you can do. Okay, so now this was Rx. How about TX now? So if you can, and, 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 and if we can do TX, we can do end-to-end, -end, the full system, right? And before I move on to TX, I want, I want to sort of go back in time, uh, the, the earlier slide that I, where I, I introduced two things and I want to, I want to sort of go, go, to, go through two reminders. 
First is uh, what we said about the distance metric. Right? So, so we said that we would be using this log loss, where if, if the transcendent was a one, then I'm going to use negative of log of the thing. And if it was a zero in that blue box here, negative of the log of one minus the soft bit coming out. And we said that the system actually outputs uh, the log of the ratio well, L of B hat instead of just B hat. And if I sort of distill all this in one equation that I'm pointing at right now with my red cursor, uh, if I sort of uh, uh, use one equation, I get this equation here, where if it's, and, and, and if you just sort of plug things in, you see that it's exactly the same thing. And if I instead use the definition of B hat as a function of the L of B hat, then I get this definition, which is exactly equivalent um, for the distance that I'm trying to minimize. So if I look at the case where the transmitted bit was a one, my, my, my distance that I'm trying to minimize is this curve on the left side of the screen. And if I take gradients and I wanna move such that I move in the right direction, uh, if the transcendent was a one, you see that I'm going to be sliding. Literally, if you go, if you go skiing, I'm going to be sliding on that side, right? And if, on the other hand, I knew that my transmit bit was a one, and I take gradients and I move way to move in the right direction, I'm going to be just like skiing. I'm going to be sliding on that side. If I take the derivative of that cost function of or, or of that distance with respect to a weight, for instance, at the receiver side, okay? This is the first reminder. The second reminder is what we said earlier on, the fact that the channel is not differentiable. The fact that I don't have a Jacobian to back propagate gradients. The fact that the input and output are integers and the fact that my system is stochastic. But the most, the hardest part is the fact that I don't have a Jacobian. If I change that 145 to 146, I don't know what's gonna be changing here. Therefore, I cannot back propagate gradients. So how do I tweak uh, weight of the transmit side such to minimize this, this objective function when the channel is not differentiable. How, how can I back prop, how do I use the chain rule of, of derivatives to find the impact of one weight at the transmit side with respect to the final output if I, if, if I don't have any function for that channel, right? That, that's pretty hard, right? This is, the, this is the challenge of training the TX. And the, the, there's sort of two main techniques to do that. There's what's called reinforcement learning and what's called a learning through trainable auxiliary channel model. Uh, reinforcement learning, which, which, which I will not address. The idea of reinforcement learning is to you, 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 you use that to learn through a system that is not differentiable. And the idea is mainly to sort of explore this, the space of possible solution and to sort of explore randomly. Right? You make sort of random decisions, random steps left and right, and you sort of randomly explore until you find, and then you draw conclusions after each exploration. And I'm, 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 I'm obviously being uh, expressing um, reinforcement learning in a, in a like layman's term. It's much more complex than that, but that's the basic idea. You explore and then lead, you draw conclusions from each exploration step and you learn very slowly this way. It's very data hungry, but it's working. And you, you have uh, publications, you have um, papers out there where uh, uh, people have, have uh, used that to train the transmitter. The other thing that I'm going to be talking about is learning through a trainable auxiliary channel model, where you create an auxiliary system that is, that is di di differentiable, and you learn the TX with the help of that system. And uh, there's sort of two out of many possible approaches to do so, therefore, to uh, learn the TX DSP. Um, they're, they're quite different. They look similar, but they're quite different. The first one is uh, use, you, uh, again, you train this auxiliary channel model, which pretty much uh, you inject to this auxiliary channel model, the same integers as you would to, as, as you would to your real system. So the, the integers you send to your DAC, you also send to your model. And the system output, these integers, you actually compare what the auxiliary channel models outputs compared to what the, the, what the real system outputs. And you first train that channel model such that on average, the channel model spits the same sort of integer as the real channel does. So you first train that. 
and then you can you, you you can also train the receiver side DSP because that's the easy part. You have the input, you have the integers, you have an objective function to minimize. You can directly compute gradients. So you 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 train the receiver DSP, and then you train the RZA channel model, and then you can once if I use my pointer here, once that's trained, then you can back propagate gradients through this differentiable channel model to then train weights at the transmitter. And you repeat, but and that, now you will generate a different DSP at the TX, which will inject something different of different distribution to the channel. The channel may behave differently because the channel may be nonlinear. So therefore, what, what, what I will see coming up, you have different statistics. I'll need to retrain the RX. Most importantly, I'll need to retrain the auxiliary model to then retrain the transmitter. And I just repeat this loop until I've pretty much maximized, I've minimized that value here for both RX DSP and, and, and TX DSP weights. The other uh, method, which as I said, looks the same, but it's actually quite different. It's used this uh, relatively recent concept. I think it's less than a decade old called the uh, generative adversarial network. It's, it's pretty complicated, it's feasible, we, it's been done, it's been published. I don't fully recommend it in terms of like, like doing this on a real field deployed system running on an ASIC, because it's quite intensive, but it works as follows. You use a classifier to at the, at the receiving end, and this classifier spits a single value. Like it, 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 it spits, it outputs a probability at the output that I should have put here, but my red cursor is one output, is the single output of the classifier. And the, you inject to the classifier the real integers from the system, as well as the integers out, uh, coming out of the uh, channel model. And you train the classifier to better classify this as that's coming from this, this is coming from that. That's coming from this, this is coming from that. So better differentiate the two. At the same time, you train the auxiliary channel model to fool the classifier into thinking that the model is actually generating something that looks like what the channel is actually outputting. And this is this is called a minimax game. And so you pit one against the other, you pit the model against the, against the classifier until pretty much you, you reach what's called Nash equilibrium, right? There's, there's, a, there's stability here and you've completely fooled the classifier. The classifier does not know anymore what's coming out of the channel versus the, uh, uh, versus the model. And the beauty of this thing, I should have mentioned, I, I forgot, but sorry, this is stupid. The idea is to inject also noise to the auxiliary channel model. And, and you can learn therefore the um, stochastic behavior of the channel by learning and shaping the injected noise via the auxiliary channel model. So you both inject the integers, which is deterministic, because the integers z, the z vector, is fully, uh, fully, is fully determined by the hard bits coming in. The noise is not. So this model will learn both the deterministic and stochastic response thanks to the idea of fooling a classifier. Okay, I'm being quite simplistic here. There's a lot at hand, there's, there's a lot at play, but you first train the, jointly the classifier and the model, and then you can back propagate gradients, changing the statistics, retraining the uh, RX, retraining the classifier jointly with the model, back propagating gradients all the way, and that's the game of training the TX. Once again, as you can obviously see, training TX is quite hard. Training RX is, to my point of view, pretty easy. Uh, but the challenge, and the cool thing is to train the TX, because if you, if you train the TX, then you can do end-to-end -end and you can learn exactly to communicate through the specific system that you have at hand. Now, a recent result. Um, again, I wanted to present a lot of results, but I'm only gonna present one. And um, surprise, surprise, it's coming from uh, Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, we, we, so last ECOC 2020, we actually did train a TX. This is not the only thing that we did. We also did this GAN approach with another uh, brilliant uh, PhD candidate that uh, we had in 2018, I believe. Uh, but I'm just gonna present this one now where we, we had a field deployed system, or sorry, we had a deployed system, a full blown sort of a fiber optic communication system. And we use a certain architecture. I'm not gonna go through all the details. It's in that ECOG paper. You have the title at the bottom of the screen. We have a certain architecture for the, for the, for the TX sort of DSP using, again, quote unquote, machine learning, where we also use the Nazi channel model. And by training the TX, 
we were able to gain in SNR 1.2 dB or in GMI, which is average distance, the average log distance if you wish that I, that I uh, talked about later um, earlier on, the improved the GMI by uh, 0.35, which uh, point, uh, point, point 0.34, sorry, which is huge just by training the TX. And as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, that's the histogram when we do sort of linear FIR pre emphasis the histogram at the, of the Y values at the receiver. I, I, I talked about the, that distribution, right? Uh, if I use linear, so it's sort of conventional uh, um, pre-distortion, and if I use the neural net one. And as you can see, the, not, not only is the standard deviation much smaller, but it's, but it's much better distribution, much more equally distribution. Uh, di distributed, sorry, by by learning the TX. So there's a lot of gain uh, into learning the TX uh, uh, digital pre-emphasis function. Now I have pretty much zero minutes left. I wanted to do at the very end sort of a whirlwind tour of what we discussed today. Uh, I'll try to do this in 60 seconds. So what we said is, Shannon modeled the system as this, uh, uh, symbol coming in, noise, output. We said real practical systems are quite different. We, are, we have a task to learn the posterior. Uh, Shannon uh, defines the red box as being this, the Gaussian. Uh, the system doesn't really output B. Problem with sound? This for systems is that the whole system is not differentiable. Um, the, cha the channel adds a stochastic term. We only control integers, and we don't challenge a specific the fiber optic communication system is that because of the way we detect signals, the, the, the statistics of the input to the receiver is always time, is time, time varying, so that's bad. Uh, we learned approaches for the uh, TX, Sorry, this is for the RX side, which is either learning something that is not Gaussian or, uh, or approach to learning the LLRs per bit using the sample value or the third approach, which is really hard. Uh, the neural net does everything, but the challenge is that the, the, again, the input is not stationary. That's for RX. For TX, we learned two things, uh, either training a auxiliary by minimizing the square distance or using this GAN technique, this generative adversarial network technique, which is quite computationally hungry, but does work. And then for the interested, one last sort of 10 seconds. For those interested, I found that guy on, I'm a huge YouTube fan, by the way. I found that guy on YouTube, he's, he must be a prof somewhere, either in the US or in Canada. His name is Mathem Mathematical Monk on YouTube. This would be a nice compliment to this talk and David Sad's talk on, I believe this was on Monday. He has a full series on information theory, really good. 160 videos on machine learning, on information theory and on probability primers. I highly, highly recommend that guy. I don't know who he, who he is in real life. He's sort of hiding under this, this pseudo, pseudonym, but it, it's excellent, I, I recommend. And don't hesitate to reach uh, out to me. Uh, I typically always answer my emails. So if you have any questions that I can't answer now, I will get back to you uh, later on. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and I'm open to, to thank questions. Thank you very much, Matthew, for beautiful example, how machine learning is implemented in uh, real systems. Uh, you obviously have uh, Vlad, who is very much interested and he followed almost uh, every, okay, eight slide. Uh, probably we can start from that. Uh, can you see, question and answers chat. Yes, so Vlad is asking okay. questions. He referred to particular slides even. Yes, yeah, so slide 24 nine. and 30. I'll try to, mm -hmm. um, I'm not how to quickly jump to slides, so let me. So the main way to jump to, and Vlad, if I, um, I didn't read your question yet, but if I can't answer your question, I will get back to you. On hey, slide nine. nine. Why would be better? this? Okay. I assume because the next is 10. So uh, why is it better to penalize huge distortion by using the, the log loss instead of the square loss distance? Um, can we get strong gradient with square distance? 
Well, no, because again, um, it's a it's a it's a good question. Obviously, you will never get an infinite like um, you will you will never get an, an infinite uh, gradient if you're completely off, even if you use the square law, because otherwise the 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 scalar in front of this thing here, I'm not sure if you can see. Oh, this is, this is not convenient. You would need to have like a scalar here that is infinity, right? So you will never learn. Um, you, you will never learn something that is as as uh, as good. Plus, actually, the log loss. The reason why we use the log loss is I'm 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 I, uh, I'm introducing this um, because it's it, it's actually minimizing the what's what's called the binary cross entropy, right? Which is in theory what we want to do. I, I'm using this other loss as a as a way to represent what should not be done. Uh, and you can clearly see from the dictogram why one gets better gradients and better distances. Um, but you can you can read information theory books to tell you that what you need to do, <laughs> what you need to use, is really the log loss. Because of that, if you if that's not clear, please reach out to me. I'll move on to the second question, which is on slide 24. Because of lack of time, I know it's already sort of almost late. Uh, that's fine. They kept lunch, so time. What have I done here? We'll get there. Okay. Is naive base class of values used in practice for demodulating symbols? Um, I get, I do not know. I don't want to address something stupid. Uh, by naive base, you assume uh, independence. Uh, independence of the bits, yes. Independence of the symbols, uh, it depends. And I'm, I'm not, my background is not exactly in information theory. I, I believe the answer is no, but I may be wrong. And I would recommend books in information theory. Uh, one book by David McKay, for instance. You can again get back to me if you want to have the links. Uh, if you want to get better, a, better, uh, a, a better answer on that specific question. But I believe the answer is no. Slide 30. Uh, can we learn the parameter of the Gaussian distribution mean variance in blind unsupervised mode without any training? Um, whoops, you, well, you can, I mean, you can always sort of have data and estimate what's the mean and what's the variance, right? You can have like a, a, a maximum likelihood estimate of the, of the mean and you can have maximum likelihood of the, um, of the standard deviation without priors. So I guess, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, and thank you. Well, thank you for your question. Again, I hope they were good uh, answers. If they were not, then you can definitely uh, uh, call me or send me an email. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, is it possible to uh, uh, simulate the channel during training or do you need to use a physical? You can use, you can simulate. The problem with uh, fiber can get Fiber optic communication system, as you know, is that the uh, Mannikoff PMD equation is pretty computationally heavy to simulate. If you really want to do it for real, uh, it's uh, it's it's pretty much power hungry, right? So you can simulate the whole thing, but uh, it's going to be power hungry. And by simulation, what like it, let's say that you use like the split step for you method, then every step forward. <clears throat> You need to save the trace because you need to backpropagate gradients afterwards. So it's it's not only super power hungry to do, for instance, split step for method and simulate the channel as you say, um, and then learn the TX, then to just do it for real. Um, and the the other advantage of doing it for real compared to simulation is that you may use parameters in your simulation, for instance, you may assume a certain gamma for the care linearity, you may assume a certain beta two for the dispersion or what have you, you may assume some parameters or like, you know, so like a EDFA noise figure that may not match exactly the real system that you have at hand. So yes, you can simulate, but A, it's power hungry, uh, B, it's memory hungry, and C, you may not exactly use the right parameter for the very system you have at hand. So hopefully, I, I guess this uh, I guess this uh, answers the question. So, can I ask also a question? So, maybe even two questions. 
sort of starting one is just to check because uh, it might be something silly. So you have uh, two expressions for your L function, right? For ones and for zeros. So no, th yeah, th does yeah. it require some a priori knowledge? <laughs> that for training, I understand that, but when you use it, yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah. I'm trying to find the right place. So there's, there's only one value for L. There's L is the log, if you see my red cursor, it's yeah, the yeah. log of this thing. Okay. Maybe oh. maybe I went too quickly there. So if you go to the next slide. Yes, when, when you uh, went through pictures, so it was one picture for ones and one for zeros. That's why I misinterpreted here. Uh, yeah, but uh, yes, but the, um, yes, this is uh, later on, later on, later on. Yeah, here, I guess. So this is, so L yeah, in that case is the, is the, is the, uh, oh, the X axis. So L is sort of one, one scalar, right? So the, there's only sort of for, for one estimate of the transmit, for one estimate of the log likelihood of the posterior probability of transmitting a one, there's, there's, there's only one value. What I, what I did mention is that, which is true, let me go back a couple of slides. Um, there's obviously the posterior that bi equals one and also the posterior that bi equals zero. But these two posterior, as you can see from the denominator here, they must sum to one. Like uh, if I tell you the posterior of bi equals one, given that I'm sampling y is whatever value, point, point 0.23, then the posterior that bi equals zero must be uh, 0 0.77, right? They, mu they must sum to one. Like if you flip a coin, the, 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 the odds of getting something versus the other, these two quantity must sum to one. But, and, and because they must sum to one, I can, I can, I can do this trick here uh, of the ratio, posterior for one divided by posterior zero equals this, therefore equals that. And we said that it's easier to, to take the log of this which is anyway okay because it's a bijective function. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I got it. So, uh, and one more question. Um, I, I cannot see memory embedded in this. Is it for, uh, is any way uh, memory of the fiber channel is somehow hidden here? For linear channel, it's uh, more or less clear. You know how to do it. And yeah, I did not address memory. This is true. That maybe this is this is this what this is what uh, was Vlad's question. I'm not sure if I if I if I got that mm -hmm. right. I do not. I I did not address memory here. Obviously, I did not address chromatic dispersion. I did not address ISI coming from components at the TX and components at the RX. I I I did assume that the TX DSP and the RX DSP using uh, certain filters with a certain temporal duration would sort of uh, um, alleviate the memory component. Okay. So yes, okay. this is a good remark. I should have mentioned it. I, I did not, I, I, I apologize. I, I did not uh, talk about uh, system memory in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. If uh, I cannot see more questions and it is almost perfect time for lunch. So thank you, Matthew, very much. It was really good view of how machine learning is used in practical systems. So uh, let's have a lunch break and uh, resume at, I believe, at, uh, let me check, at two o'clock. And I would like to remind you, if you have some late questions or during lunch, you got some questions to the lecturers, you can use the same chat Q&A and they might, uh, answer this offline, or you can send them email, even better, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, all speakers. Uh, I think it was very interesting morning session, very inspiring. So we deserve to have some lunch, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye for now.